Hello everyone and welcome to this Nintendo Life. My name is NBZ and you join us here for our E3 special podcast uh, where we're going to talk about things involving E3, but mainly one very important franchise, a franchise that is dear to mine and Bally's hearts. It is of course... Box Box Boy. Yes, the whole podcast is about the sequel to Box Boy. No, I'm kidding, ladies and gentlemen. I thought it was Pokemon Sun and Moon. No, of course, yeah, it, it could be. Uh, we're going to be talking about Zelda for the whole of this podcast, uh, and uh, Bally joins me. Bally, how are you? I'm I'm pretty excited. I, I, I'm pretty hyped about all this, to be honest. It's quite overwhelming. I think that's an understatement uh, for my state of being, Bally. Uh, I sat in a chair for like six and a half hours yesterday and just watched all the Zelda Treehouse um, because I couldn't pull myself away. It was that, like, this game has gripped me like nothing else. But let, we'll get into that. Um, this The layout of the show is going to be back and forth. We're just going to be talking about all the aspects of Zelda possible. Uh, we've got an email to bring in later and uh, we are going to maybe go over our predictions later on uh, at the end of the show. Uh, but we're not talking about anything else. Nintendo have announced some other stuff regarding E3, as I alluded to. The sequel to Box Boy, which we're still very excited about, uh, coming out very soon. Um, all that stuff we will be throwing into the next show, the main show which will be episode 69 um, in a couple of weeks time uh but this is our e3 special this is our breakdown this is our zelda thon um and bali uh let's just let's just get into it uh we started out with reggie on the treehouse stream uh gave us uh, a few words and then uh, sent us on our merry way to the trailer for the new zelda game breath of the wild Bali, let me hear your first impressions. How did you feel upon seeing this trailer? I, I, I was pretty stunned that they go straight into, like, you know, you don't see Link, it's just the environment. And I, and I think it's the back of Link running through all these different areas. And you're just like, okay, there's a massive focus on the environment going on here. And then you see, like, some rabbits and some deer and all these different... That's the cool thing. You see environments that you hadn't seen before. Like, so far, we've only just seen grassy plains. But here you're getting, like, snowy peaks and desert landscapes and things like that. And it just really hit you, like, how alone link was and you just get an initial sense of wow this is a very very different zelda like and it's very obvious like there's a huge focus on the wild let's just call it or as i what did i put what did what was my stupid prediction it was just like planes I had, enchanted plane enchanted plane so i like there's there was gonna be something there's gonna be some emphasis on you know the environment and that's what this trailer just had tons of yeah, it really told us that one of the main characters of this game is Hyrule. Like, this landscape is teeming with life, as they like to say multiple times, um, and just has so much interesting and secret and hidden. Like, the architecture of the land, it's obviously not something as intricate and crazy and alien as Xenoblade Chronicles X. No. But the scope is just as large and it is so exciting because when we look back at Xenoblade Chronicles X, I know you're still playing it, you know, here and there, Bally. Here and there, here and there. When I look back on Xenoblade Chronicles X, the thing I think about is the environment and the exploration and how fucking awesome it was to just go around and find places, set down nodes, like all of this stuff while you uncover this incredible, um, you know, place that they had created. But there were obviously issues I had with that game. Still loved it, but this is a game that has that style, that scope, and that scale, and it's also a fucking Zelda game. So it has the gameplay that you're looking for, or at least I'm looking for. But they've changed a lot of things. This is such a different game and there are so many things to drill into but yeah i i'll say like you can actually watch our live reaction it's uh on youtube and um that trailer really got me excited like there were so many little elements of okay there's this thing okay links in armor now holy shit he's wielding a spear oh my god he's fighting um a giant rock monster like there are loads of Things. He's making a plank levitate with a magnet. <laughs> right, like there are so many mind-blowing like, little things about you know bringing up stealth elements and 
let's dig into it, Bali. Let's start talking let's do about it. What's the, the elements details? of the game. So maybe let's kick off where they kicked off. Um, the opening of the game, I must say, is incredibly quick and incredibly mysterious at the same time. It mm. sets up a story that intrigues me from the bat. From the moment you wake up after, you know, being stuck in what seems like some liquid of... of it's not necessarily f- like... Uh, cryogenic is that what it is like being cryosis cryogenic yeah yeah being it's a similar sort of situation uh it's come out from interviews and stuff that apparently or actually this is part of like a more story focused version of the demo which they weren't showing on the treehouse because as bill trinan said they didn't want any story spoilers so i think they edited the treehouse version to not have that stuff but apparently you're waking up after 100 years. Uh, voice acting was a thing that happened straight away, um, which was interesting. Uh, but we didn't, like, when we got down to, like, the old man and stuff, he wasn't voice acting. So I imagine mm. this voice acting is going to be probably more similar to something like Fire Emblem. Yeah, where cutscene have, exclusive. Right, the big cutscenes have voice acting. Um, I, I imagine there'll be a lot more of it because this story seems to be the focus. But getting back to that idea of story and intrigue and mystery... It says Shrine of Resurrection when you wake up. And that just sends my brain whirling with theories about this and like where does it take place in the timeline and all that stuff. It's not a house, it's not a town, it's a random tomb effectively in the side of a hill. And then yeah, you... like tonally, waking up here is so starkly different to something like Skyward Sword, where it's funny because Anuma commented, like, I'm changing all these conventions of Zelda, but Link still wakes up at the start of the game. But you still have to wake up. <laughs> yeah, but like that game starts so happy clappy with the loft wing through the window, and you have friends, and you talk, and there's loads of this tutorializing. This is like, wake up, get a couple things, go out the door, and just go anywhere. Just do what you want. But before you go out the door, that the style of that tomb like you are hit by you know these blue lights that and they seem to be like a running theme of the game is this idea of like activating very old rocks and like you know that you see those spider and enemies later in the demo that were in the original trailer etc that light up blue and it's like this i just absolutely love that that look they've gone for in this game where it's it's still fantasy it's still old but there's this sense of technology uh and to be to be fair they did have this kind of uh art style to some degree in skyward sword with the time stones yes totally it's a similar look but it just it just looks a bit crisper obviously because it's wii u it just i think it's a cooler implementation in terms of the world that they've created and just it looks so good and it's so what i love is that it's just so different and like we're going to get into loads of areas this game reinvents it but that initial tomb the lighting and the emphasis on the, this blue light that is just so starkly different to traditional zelda i just thought was so cool it really sets the tone and the mood going forward uh, mm. for certain um that air of mystery and everything about it uh so yeah let's uh you know the first thing that i think struck me was hey you have gear and this gear has stats and zelda is becoming more rpg-esque like you go to those two chests you open them and you get like a top and bottoms and they're like okay this this has numbers to it they open the inventory and it's like okay you have a certain number of slots already we're thinking about stuff like from other open world rpgs where you have you know like the witcher your armor has stats and you also have an encumbrance mechanic in that game which is like if you collect too much stuff you can't move or whatever it seems like instead of an encumbrance here they're going for you just have a limited number of slots so you can only carry a certain amount of stuff which is understandable um but then we go into breaking conventions with things like weapon durability where when you start to use weapons they will not last for a very long time at all like it's not a fire emblem situation where you know you can maybe have it over five six battles and then eventually over time and you see the number it degrades this is like you get into a fight and maybe six hits later early in the game anyway your sword breaks and you're like oh shit what am i supposed to do but then the enemies also like drop their own weaponry and you can pick up like tree branches on the ground that act as swords um there just it seems like this diversity of not tying you to a single weapon and making you experiment and change things about because not only do you have swords there are clubs to be used there is lances and axes 
uh, it's just this variety that is on uh, display here. There's even a skeleton you can kill and then use his arm, and then yes. the arm is still moving even when you like put it on your back. And... Oh, so creepy, it's so just, hilarious, though. It's just, and we can get into so many more little nooks and crannies like that that are just unique to this game. Yeah, lots of little um, touches, I will say. So Talking we've come chests. Up... Sorry. Go ahead. A couple of things with chests. I need to get this off my chest, uh, should <laughs> I say. Um, <laughs> chests, like, when they open, they just, like, go peek and peek open, and they don't, like, oh, my God, the lid doesn't go fully back. And it annoy. like, this is the most annoying thing about this Zelda to me. It's the most stupid minor point in the world. But the chests don't fully open, and it's so frustrating. Like, I just look at them, and I'm like, oh, just push it back. Just, please, just push it back to the... I just I can't, I can't look at it. I hate it. It's really annoying me. Um, so maybe they'll fix that before launch, if people tell so we've, me So we've come out of the tomb, we've fought a few enemies, collected a few basic basic uh weapons uh we've got a, a bit of clothing where do we go from here uh, i i guess just looking around the environment exploring and, and finding things i think there's lots of um you, you got a lot of like elements from enemies you pick up so in skyward sword you could get stuff from enemies and then use it to create swords and shields and potions remember like you go back to sky yeah. and, and and do that and it feels like they're, they're picking up on that and going deeper with it so you have crafting mechanics i'm not sure if you can craft weaponry that stuff wasn't actually shown like whether you can make your own armor or whether you can make your own swords i would assume you can later on. Well, we know from that trailer that that's, their Link is in like a big suit of armor. And yes. we know that there are like collectible things such as amber, sapphire, metals and things that are yeah. valuable. The question is whether you can craft that yourself or whether you just find that in a, in a chest or in an environment somewhere. And I'm, I'm not sure because we haven't seen villages, we haven't seen town environments yet. We, we don't know whether that's going to play a part. We, we've not seen towns and villages, but I would I would bet loads of money that there's something in a town or village where you can go and craft with these things i don't see why they wouldn't do that and that's not to say that you might also be able to craft yourself that it's just that there might be some sort of shortcut to make it easier more streamlined who knows but i think there will be some sort of crafting element in terms of weaponry and armor yeah yeah i i think that like the amount of systems they have on display here is to a degree that is dwarfing any Zelda that we've seen before. And so I can totally imagine that, you know, that is going to be the case. Um, because, you know, there's the the stuff with the cooking they've taken. I think maybe what we should drill down into is, like, there are all these tiny little things, all these changes, these nuances, these differences to how Zelda plays. And what it really feels like is this amalgamation of all these different games over the past, you know, 30 years since the original Zelda came out. And Anuma has been like, you know what, I want to grab this bit from this game and take this from that one and this from that one. And it doesn't all necessarily feel that tacked on or canned in any way because they've taken these elements, but they've made them feel uniquely Zelda, if you know what I mean. Yes, absolutely. Like, it's... It's, it's 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 over simplistic to say this is open world meets Zelda because everyone's just like, oh it's just it's just open world Zelda it's nothing special but they've imp the way they've implemented traditional Zelda things into this open world is what is so special like we've not even gotten onto the shrines and dungeons etc but it's that kind of design and just that kind of thing that makes it so unique because it's that combined with this open world and just all of that heavy heavy dose of nintendo polish that has just been heaped on this game from everything we've seen yeah i it's funny you bring up nintendo polish because i think some people have actually been complaining about the performance of the game like not that it's bad or anything but people have been saying like that there are definitely frame rate drops happening uh maybe you know some textures being a little low and i think it's unfortunate that the first time they show this game off fully it had to be the wii u version because had it been the nx version i think that everyone would have been like even more impressed than they are right now like if you imagine this game with a little bit you know higher textures better resolution and a frame rate that's maybe approaching 60 on that system like 
that's the sort of thing that is really going to blow me away. And wow, I mean, I think, you know, that's the version that everyone's going to play anyway. Um, so if nothing else, this gets me really excited for what the NX event is going to be and how they're going to show this game off there uh, and, and stuff like that. Um, do you feel maybe because it's the Wii U version, they're losing something, Molly? I, I, the sort of cop out answer to that question is we don't know until we know what the NX is. Like, we, uh, it's just, yeah, of it's course. too. I mean, it's very easy to assume, oh, yeah, the NX, it'll run at 60, it'll look a bit crisper, but it might not. I mean, we don't know yet, and I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to confidently predict that it will yet, but we'll see. I mean, it'd be weird if the NX version does look a lot better than this if considering they chose to just show this off that would feel like a big missed opportunity knowing how far down the line the nx supposedly is yeah i i do think that they're not necessarily losing that much because a lot of internet video runs at 30 anyway i know youtube have implemented their like 60 fps uh option now but um it still looks great and i I know I disparage, uh, you know, 30 frames a second, but I do think that a solid 30 is fine. Like, it's obviously not as good as having 60, but it is still fine and doable, and I played Xenoblade okay, and I'm sure Zelda will be fine. I'm just really looking forward to, you know, what that next version holds. But just talking about that stuff, the visuals and all the aesthetics, it still looks damn incredible. I think that the art style they have chosen, we were a fan of it in the, you know, previous trailer and the kind of materials leading up to this. Seeing it in action in a full-scale world with the lighting and the trees and the grass, like, I was talking, obviously, last time about Witcher 3 and that grass, and while, obviously, on a technical level, Witcher 3's grass is outstanding, this grass ain't half bad itself, you know? Uh, It still looks damn good. And Witcher 3 is ultimately going for close to realism. Like, close. No, I'm not going to say realism necessarily, but this game is, it's like that, 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 it's knockoff realism. It's realism with this heavy punch of just cell shaded art that just it's works Japanese so animation well. is what it is. It's an anime style, to be honest. It, absolutely. And it just looks so, so good. And I mean, we compared it to Xenoblade Chronicles X earlier and like like you said, this is a this is a more realistic environment in terms of uh geography and it just looks so so good like from the snowy mountains we saw to just like the trees and like you said obviously the grass like the grass cutting in this game looks so much nicer and just to, just to add to how good the cutting the grass looks like there are no rupees so far in this game there are no like collectible hearts on the ground that we know of and it just means that when you do cut grass you're not you're not leaving you know an unrealistic trail of money and loot in the grass you're just you're just clearing a path and it, it almost adds like a nice artistic um extra punch to that that idea of just cutting grass yeah we were joking earlier about how you can just cut through the grass like write something in the grass and then find like a higher area and look yeah. down and you've like graffitied in the grass and stuff uh, like that. screw you sony just like in yeah. the grass and the hat. yeah <laughs> Oh man, you're reminding me of Hey You Pikachu now, like when you said Sony into the microphone and Pikachu got mad. Uh, that was good stuff. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think like you're, you're telling people like, yes, the, there's no rupees and hearts in the grass. That's just like significant about how bucking the trend this Zelda game is and how you expect certain elements and Anuma was just like, you know what? No, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to, why was this tradition in the first place? You know, we're just going to change it up and make something different. And so you have um, all these weapon durability stuff. You have, obviously we are going to get into like shrines and stuff like that, but the overworld seems very much based on this idea of traversal and nothing more so becomes apparent than like link's ability literally to climb on anything and the stamina Mm. meter like factoring into that how do you feel about this you know just do you think because anuma said that his approach to open world was going to be different and that he wanted to like add this twist to it do you think we've seen that twist yet do you think this whole idea of climbing on any surface is that twist because to me 
that really sets it apart from something like, say, GTA 5 or The Witcher, because they say you can go anywhere, but that means, like, on the ground. Like, it doesn't necessarily mean, like, you're climbing up these mountain faces, whereas Link can literally touch every surface and be on every surface, and that is kind of crazy. I think... I think it's almost an impossible task to try and define that twist that he's talking about. I completely agree that you're right. There is an extra degree of exploration that you get from that ability to climb. And I'm really excited to like play this game and see what that that feels like. And I was just joking with you earlier, like when you go to another open world game that's not going to be this game, you'll kind of might end up disappointed when you start trying to climb up walls that you suddenly can't climb anymore. But when Anuma said twist, I the biggest thing I get is that basically they've thrown... It doesn't stick to a rigid Zelda script in any way. And I would argue from even the most unusual Zeldas, from, I don't know, Spirit Tracks to Link Between Worlds, I'd still argue that they all stick to a pretty strict script in so many ways. And this just throws so much of it out the window but at the same time still feels like Zelda and that is I, I bet you that was a fine balance that they constantly juggled with all throughout the development of this game I mean they might still be juggling with that those two sides but it just feels like Zelda but at the same time it never feels tied down by anything in terms of oh, you have to squeeze in this Zelda trope and you have to do this. The you, you can't get that weapon until this weapon because you have to do this to unlock that dungeon. It's like there's just none of that in this game. It feels far more There's no more traditional fresh. gatekeeping as there was before. None. And it's it's just, it's a breath of fresh air. Breath of the wild. Breath of fresh air. Yeah, breath air. of the wild air. Um, uh. And I, I mean, on that name, I think the name does sum up that freshness, it sums up new ideas like the idea of link in the wild like the idea of the wild has never been hinted or at in the zelda game before it's been open world obviously with something like wind waker it feels open world but it's not it's not they've never made such a point of cementing link into nature and the wild and wildlife it's always towns and farms and this sort of thing this is so different yeah I th- Sorry, I that was a that long we... rant. <laughs> That's all right. I, th- I think we will get to the towns and villages and the NPCs and everything, and uh, we'll Definitely. talk about that later. Um, uh, but obviously for this, this felt to me like, here are the mechanics on display, and let's give you a tour de force of that. And as a gameplay-focused guy, I think that actually spoke to me much more. Um, the obvious like minimalist story notes we have have, I, as I said, intrigued me but I was far more interested in how this game was going to play. And mm. I think we have got that in abundance. Like we really and understand that. It was really good because Bill Trinan said very early on, he said, for all you people scared about spoilers, um, I'm going to come clean. Uh, we've, you know, we're not going to cover any characters or story or things today. There's no spoilers in that sense. We're just going to talk about mechanics. And I think, broadly speaking, they were true to their word. And they really did show how the game plays and how those mechanics function. And we're still left wondering, like, what, what the hell is going on? Like, why doesn't he have a green tunic yet? And all these plot points that are just so mysterious that are quite exciting. I think, actually, the funny thing about the green tunic is we can kind of, from the mechanics, infer why that's not the case. It's because this world is so dependent upon finding new upgrades and new armor and everything that you're constantly going to be changing. So you never want to be stuck in that same traditional garb. Mm. You always want to be looking for the next thing and finding something with better defense and looking for something which maybe has, you know, cold resistance, which we can talk about, like all these environments. So, um... A point that I wanted to get to was there's a clear survival game influence here. And I think that ties into the idea of the wild. Like we have elements from Minecraft, like building, chopping down trees and getting wood and taking like flint and uh, wood together. And if you like use your sword on them, it turns into a campfire. How do you feel about, you know, because there is this big, I think it's one of the things that has defined this new generation of people who play games in Minecraft and like Daisy and all these survival things is, you know, surviving for yourself and finding stuff around you and, you know, just trying to 
you know, create your own world almost. Yeah. Uh, it, they're not really creating their own world here, but are you happy that they're bringing these elements in? Do you think it fits with Zelda or do you think it's a little out of place? I mean, ultimately, survival is not a type of game I've ever really tried before. And yeah. to be honest, if I'm going to try one, I want to try Nintendo's take on it. And that's effectively what this game is feeling like. I, I am... Yeah. I am... <sighs> Like, Zelda, I am so of the opinion, and this I have this opinion on loads of game series, where there's always... I'd, I'd way rather they risk the ugly duckling in the series than try and keep every game in the series, you know, of a top tier. And I'm not saying Absolutely. this game is an ugly duckling, but I'm saying they've taken a risk. They've taken a gamble. They've said, let's tr mix, mix it up. In the same way that a game like Metroid Prime 2 Echoes, like it's a notoriously hard game I've just done. There are parts of that game that are really not much fun at all, but ultimately I'm really glad I played it, and ultimately I'm glad it's part of the Metroid series. This game is just different and fresh, and obviously there's going to be a minority of Zelda fans like, oh, it's not traditional Zelda, I don't like it. It's like, that's fine. If you want to play your traditional Zelda, you can go back and play Twilight Princess. You can play Ocarina of Time. There are so many of those traditional Zeldas that exist. Exactly, like, like don't... An abundance. Don't get salty at the new one because they've tried something different. And I would, like, even if, if this game flops, which I, I've, I've, I've got this gut instinct that I don't think it's going to. But even if it did, oh, no. I'm still of the opinion you got to take the risk, take a punt when you have a series that is so similar for so long. And I'm not criticizing all the other Zeldas for being similar. Um, but when you compare them to this they do kind of look more similar than they did before. And it's just so totally. great that this game is taking a bit of a leap into the dark. And I'm just going to say, I think it's going to pull off. And I think, you know, the gaming industry is going to take note. Yeah. Um, I wonder about, uh, you know, people levying criticisms at this game. And the one thing I've seen so far the most uh, is people saying the game looks empty. Um, and this was something that people were worried about when they originally showed it at the Game Awards, that they were wandering around, there wasn't much there. Um, and I, I kind of don't understand this criticism. And I kind of went off on a rant on Twitter about it. Because I take a look at something like Xenoblade Chronicles X, and you can argue that that game is just as empty in the sense that you're just wandering around open space and there are enemies around, but there's not much, like, side quests to interact with or people to interact with, right? Yeah. And yet, Xenoblade Chronicles X has one of the most satisfying open worlds to walk around and explore and discover that I've ever been mm. a part of. So, for me, that openness and that ability to, you know, go across these grassy plains and ride with my horse and take time to get somewhere to feel the the length of these lands like beneath me that's something that i actually want like i want there yeah. to be places where there's not necessarily anything because yeah. it makes it feel like a journey that is occurring that you're going somewhere that you're discovering something that you're being a part of a world that is more tangible and not like dense and just packed with a ton ton of like you know criticisms of, of assassin's creed is like you open the map and there's like fucking seven million markers because there's loads yeah. of these different things to do i like the fact that this game doesn't seem to do that yeah i mean i i can completely see where those people are coming from because for many people the most important part especially of the 3d zeldas is you know those towns and interactions with npcs and I, i'll admit i think somewhere like windfall island and wind waker is one of maybe my favorite places in video games i think it's so cool but ultimately and this relates to the point i was making before i want them to jump into the dark and try something new if this game doesn't have a single town in it but they but they take me on this journey that you know is in the wild like they suggest and they do it well fine all all credit to them but if, if this game does have a town in it that's fine too I, i'm of the i'm sort of I've decided that, you know, I have faith in Nintendo with whatever decision they make with regards to having towns and NPCs or not. That essentially, they're trying something different. If they don't want to have towns, that's fine. But if they do, I think that's cool too. And I think that I, I, I would agree with you, Emiza. I think it is cool that you can have these massive, expansive spaces and then ultimately you might get to a town eventually. But it, 
I like that it's that's not crucial. It's just a thing. And I think maybe that's what this game will go for, is that the towns um, are just a thing. They're not, they're not as big of a deal as perhaps they are in a game like Wind Waker or Ocarina. Absolutely. Um, but we know they will exist. We just haven't seen them. Um, so then let's maybe, I don't know, let's talk about combat. Uh, the the combat in this game seems very interesting. It, it to me, uh, I know like everyone will say, ah, oh, it's it looks like Zelda, and it does to some extent. But there are also like these new wrinkles to it. I think there's maybe a pseudo Souls influence in the sense that you are committing to an attack animation, and like if mm. Link jumps forward with his sword and it gets stuck on the ground there is significant punishment for you if you miss the enemy. Like, there is a good time delay there where they can come in and take you out. Um, like, similar to when you get hit to the ground, he kind of crumples up in a ball and, like, is kind of protecting himself, you know? And it takes longer than usual for him to get up and start fighting again. Um, there seems to be a danger to enemies that there wasn't before, and you seem to take hits harder. Uh, and going in with the RPG elements, enemies now have health bars. They have a set amount of damage you do to them based on the sword or weapon you have. Um, and there are elements like uh, from Bayonetta with this flurry dodge thing where if you parry at the right time or if you dodge out the way at the right time, you get like this matrix like slowdown where you can just wail on them super hard. So lots of different elements here, Bali. I think there's stuff being cribbed from Wind Waker. I think there's stuff being cribbed from Souls. Like, How do you mm. feel about what you've seen so far of, of how the combat plays out? It's fresh. I mean, I like it. Uh, I, I think that before this game, my favorite combat in a 3D Zelda is probably Wind Waker. I think um, Skyward Sword was obviously unique, but I love that this game is just cribbing from different ideas. And you're right, like the Wind Waker elements seem to be implemented really well, like that sort of slow-mo parry style thing. Um, it's it's what I've said for every point in this game. It's something fresh. It's something different. I'm willing to try it. And it looks like you do have to be more prepared before you go into these battles. There's a lot of sense of, shall I take on this battle or shall I leave it? Like, shall I drink some more potions to boost my health before going in or shall I leave it? And it seems quite easy to die. Um, it'll be interesting to see sort of what the punishment and where on earth you end up going when you do die. Uh, but... I like it so far. I think it's different. And I, I personally think some of the animations, especially with that big heavy axe, it looks so good. Like it looks Especially like when you wind up for a spin attack. Oh, like there's this real so nice. build of momentum. It's like someone at the Olympics doing the hammer throw where you just start mm. slow and then just start spinning real quick. That happens with like a claymore you get later on. I saw someone use as well. Um, so, yeah, it's yeah, that, just... that is really great. All, all these things put together, it just looks like a nice... It looks like it's fresh, but at the same time, it has traditional elements. Um, yeah, you've still, you're still got Zed targeting, which is wonderful. I love that. And I think that's just such precisely. a smart thing that they need to bring forward because it's an, a key element of Zelda. And it's just... It's a part of 3D combat that not many other games do these days. Like, I found... Like, Witcher, for example, has a targeting system, but I think it's bad, and I don't really tend to use it. Um, Zelda is the one game where... I just feel like I crutch on it all the time. I, I, I like using it. So uh, yeah. I'm glad that they didn't get rid of that. Um, but just talking about the things around combat is like the, the different way you can approach scenarios. Like stealth is an aspect of this game. A wonderful addition is this little sound meter in the bottom, which tells you how much noise you're making when you move, mm. which allows mm. you to like creep up to an enemy camp, make sure you're not taking any noise. Like you can crouch to make sure no one hears you. Um, you have the ability with a gamepad to scope out... Like, this game has fucking Metal Gear Solid Five stuff in it. It's insane. Like, yeah. you just fucking scope out enemies to see their health bars and decide whether or not and how you want to approach it. It's real. Like, it's cribbing from so many different ideas. It's so hard to keep track of them all. Like, Minecraft, MGS5, like, traditional RPGs. Yeah. We've got... Like, it's just throwing everything at the board and so somehow it's all sticking and that's wonderful because you get moments where like bill trinan pops down these barrels and because of this advanced physics system they have the fire starts spreading from these wooden objects to this other wooden object to the explode the barrel which blows 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 up and like all of it is this wonderful interconnected like emergent gameplay that is one of my favorite things that came out of mgs5 last year and i'm so excited that zelda is like moving in that direction 
Yeah, it, it's it's such an evolution when you think about it like that. The number of ways you can go in. And it's ultimately from the ground up. It's from the weapon system. It's from, you know, this crazy-ass tablet that you've got that actually fits in thematically in a really weird way that there's this sort of almost... I, I struggled really early... I struggled earlier on in this uh, episode to try and describe it, but it's like that blue light I was talking about. It's It's... It's almost sci-fi fantasy. Shall we go with that? It's it's sure. Just so... I mean, it's basically the original Xenoblade Chronicles, where you're in this fantasy world yeah. and then these robot mechs attack, and you're you're kind of it's merging really the similar. Two. That's a good comparison. And it, it once you have that, and we can get into how this weapon works, you know, magnets and all that crazy shit. But yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It ultimately makes sense that it's almost like got a computer that you can like use to spy on those enemies and likewise. And like like you said about the little sound dot, like it's so cool just having a little visual indicator. So I don't know if you're deaf, you can still see it, or if you're listening to a podcast or whatever, it still right. works. Like it's just such clever game implementation. Like that is how you make games slicker, better to yeah. play. It's like, why has no stealth game ever done something like that? Before? Exactly. Why, why does it take a Nintendo to think of like, it's just a simple, easy idea. Everyone always goes, oh, how did he spot me? How did he know I was yes. there? How did, yes. like every single stealth game Anytime you get caught, and this even happened in Wind Waker and Forsaken Fortress, people would be like, oh, how did he get me? How did that happen? And it's just like, well, because that dot was telling you it was going to happen. So like, it's yes. actually like a nice way of the game telling you what's going on. Yeah, like even in combat, you can throw your weapons at enemies. And here's another wrinkle. This is something I found out by like looking at a stream you can use the magnesis, which is this item, the rune that we'll talk about later on, which basically lifts up anything magnetic, to lift up your sword from far away and swing it around and attack enemies from a distance. Oh, like, wow. th- like what? There, th- this is the sort of stuff where everything just connects together. And the thing that it gets in my head is like my favorite element of Skyward Sword was the beetle because it did so yeah. many different things. This game feels like everything is the beetle. There's a beetle, <laughs> yes. The, the sword can be just used in combat. You can throw at enemies. You can use the magnesis to, like, flutter it in their face. You can steal weapons from enemies. You can, you know, throw it into something to cause a chain reaction of a fire exploding. Like, yeah. it just feels like every just... part and every part of this physics design is created to be used in conjunction with one another even even within that physics engine just something so simple that i don't believe has been done before where you have two types of bombs one is cylindrical it's not cylindrical spherical that, that rolls spherical, yeah and then the other one is a cuboid that obviously stays still because it's a cuboid and you, yeah. that's the other thing with the bombs you control when they explode and it's just one of them obviously stays still, the other you can roll, and it's just so clever. And on top of all of that, the bomb explosions look incredible. Like, oh. I love but, that they've just taken the system from Link Between Worlds of the Magic Meter and basically given each uh, rune its own meter to the point where yeah. you have to wait for it to recharge, but like you're never worried about refilling bombs. You're not, like That was one of my favorite things about that game is it took away the need to micromanage all, like, how many arrows do I have, all of that stuff. And I think arrows are still a thing in this game, but you find so many of them, and also it's been said that if an enemy fires at you, uh, then it just gets stuck in the grass, and you can pick it up, and you can basically farm arrows from enemies. Um, mm. So, like, it doesn't become a concern anymore. When we're talking about this this physics engine, action oriented world... Now is probably a good time just to mention two things, the glider and the snowboarding. Sure, yeah, let's do that, because those are like real neat touches. I mean, these are two items that have been in lots of different games, but ultimately it's just two really simple things to add into this game world that just make traversal more fun, faster, more logical. If you're at the top of a snowy mountain, like it's pretty fun to like snowboard down it and... It allows you to explore if there's any secret caves or anything. But if you want, you know, the faster route down, you can just glide down the mountain. And like, or this... if you're a badass, you can do both at once and just exactly. like glide, drop, drop onto your board, and then glide again. Like they showed a segment from later in the game where someone does exactly that, and it's just beautiful in motion because 
just like the beetle, the shield is not just a shield anymore. You can use it as a fucking surfboard. Like, it's insane. Yeah. And it's just really simple things that are supposedly in the game relatively early on, which is also a bonus. And they just make world traversal better and gameplay better. It's it's just such a great implementation. And we've always talked about the physics engine, but the animation he uses for both of them just works so well. And it's it's a nice, simple thing that adds a lot. Yeah, like the ability to push boulders onto enemies and like pick up things and throw them. And like, there's lots of things that traditional Zelda did, but we're just like taking them to another level. It, it felt a lot to me like, and we talked about this, but like trying to, where it felt like you can approach any situation and have a unique solution that's all your own. And I think the physics engine that this game has implemented allows that level of, you know, just character agency. Hmm. Um, so before we move on from combat, there are a couple of really cool things that I wanted to point out about the enemy AI and how they work, which I heard from a couple of people and from uh, some YouTube videos. Uh, so if an enemy drops their weapon, there's there's a point at which um, someone said uh, they took the sword from an enemy. The enemy, in a struggle to find something to hit the player with, grabbed a rock from the ground and threw it at them. So like not having the ability to hit the player they're just like oh, i'm just going to scramble and find something and found this rock and started throwing that and hurling it instead because they didn't have a weapon anymore also when someone was fighting a stalfos they destroyed uh the body of one but the head was left and one of the stalfos's buddies decided to pick up its friend's head and use that as a weapon as a projectile <laughs> wow. so like everything is just it feels so handcrafted and we expect this level of polish from mm. nintendo right this like all these little nuances but in a world this big and exactly. this open it feels that much more impressive you know and that's exactly what we were saying earlier like this isn't just zelda merged with open world this is zelda merged with open world with that extra degree of polish and fine design, gameplay design that just makes everything smoother and more intricate and it all works together in this really complicated but ultimately smooth machine that just works so well. Absolutely. Um, so maybe uh, it's a good time to talk about... Runes. Yes, the, the, the shrine, the puzzles, the runes, Dungeons. all that stuff. So there was a rumor before uh, all this uh, Zelda information dropped that there was going to be these mini dungeons, like over a hundred of them, and they would make up a, a good portion of, uh, you know, your traditional Zelda puzzle solving stuff, and that there would be four main dungeons. Is that what uh, people are saying? I think the rumor is four main dungeons. Uh, they've hinted, they've they've said that there are main dungeons but we don't know how many yes. main dungeons yet i believe and we haven't seen any footage of a, like a proper dungeon yet and we know that um, there's over a hundred shrines yes yeah um so so now we know that we we maybe can assume that the, the dungeon number was true from the rumor but we'll find out i hope it's a bit more than that but we'll see this is a big game so <laughs> we'll have to wait um but uh, so, so the shrines themselves are just these areas. I think they can also act as fast travel points. By the way, I saw a video today of someone fast traveling. It looks super cool. Mm -hmm. Link just turns into like blue like um, mist or whatever and just like flies away into the, the ether and then reappears where his fast travel point is. Um, just stylish as hell. Like everything in this Very game cool. is super stylish. Um, but the shrines, uh, basically underground areas, they all seem to have the same aesthetic of kind of the, this kind of blue aesthetic that you were talking about before. Um, and they're self contained, like mini puzzle rooms where you have like maybe a couple, three uh, different puzzles to figure out. And at the start of each one, at least what they showed, you uh, achieved a new ability. And these abilities are all built into the Sheikah slate you have. Uh, that is the you know the item you get at the start of the game that acts as your map and lets you set waypoints and things like that um, and these are known as runes so the runes include uh, traditional Zelda items like the bombs as we said but we have the rolling bombs and the square bombs which are you know two different versions that one can stand and one can uh, move about and then three new abilities that they showed off so one of them was stasis which is a time stop mechanic which basically you use it on a specific object and it holds it in place 
Um, there is a freeze water ability that creates a platform out of water, which is reminiscent of the sand wand in Spirit Tracks, where you like pushed up sand from the ground. I think Link Between Worlds has a similar wand as well. Uh, I think the sand wand is, or the sand rod is something that's been in multiple games. Um, so that's there. And then the third one is, of course, Magnesis, which uh, we talked about earlier, but it is essentially Link brings out this uh, giant magnet and is able to move any kind of metallic object in the world to the point where in one of the shrines, like he reaches up and there's this chest on this ledge and he basically just brings it down to where he is. Like, there's no figuring out how to get up there. It's like, you come to me, Chess. This is how this works now, uh, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, but yeah, so this whole new system of runes is essentially what looks like the items of this game. Like, we're not going to be going in and opening a chest and getting a hookshot out. Instead, we're just adding to this arsenal of kind of mythical, magical objects that just appear from the Sheikah Slate. How do you feel about that, Bally? Do you think it's a nice way to change things up? Uh, do you think uh, it's it's a good thing to go forward with? I mean, you say that, but th- we do know that there's a fire rod. Yes, that's so, true. So, I, I personally think it'll be a it'll be a mixture. But if in terms of the runes themselves, I think I absolutely love them. I think it's it's a great way to implement, you know, that blue thematic light that I was talking about earlier, and at the same time coming up with all these innovative weapons that use the gamepad in a a bit you know in terms of gyro and obviously now we know that the nx must have some sort of gyro in it which i don't think is you know that unusual and like the the hd remake some of the best moments are are the ability you know to to use the bow and arrow using the gyro and it's nice that this game has implemented that but i just think that the, the the runes and having all these different uses for that is perfect like it's a really great idea it also works from a story perspective because it's not like link just stashing this massive ball and chain in his pants you know like <laughs> it it's yes. actually logical that it just pops out magically of this this sheikah slate instead yeah of him just carrying a thousand i mean he's, he's still him. stashing like a, a whole hand glider in there but you're right yeah. it's not quite as unbelievable as a ball and chain actually one of the things i really like is you look at his back and you see all the weapons he's carrying yeah Yeah, Yeah. you you have the layer of the shield and the bow and the axe and all the stuff just at the same time all loaded on there um which is great it really gives you like that that feeling of survival and hunting and just being out there Mm. with all your tools at your disposal um so very cool stuff with these runes uh the point you made about the fire rod though i think is interesting because I think that that fire rod being stashed away with other breakable items means that it is more of a generic thing than a like an essential part of your toolkit in the sense that swords break and you know axes and things are going to break. I think that fire rod has like limited use on it as well. So it's not so it's you're going to find like multiples of those throughout the world I think and I think that's good because something like the fire rod, the ice rod, they seem like more generic items in Mm. older Zelda games. And uh, the fact that they are not like part of this new arsenal of different weapons, uh, I think is smart. Because otherwise you would have the fire rod popping out of the Sheikah slate and it like being a recharge based thing. Whereas this is like, it's in the inventory with weapons and and stuff like that. And that's exactly what is so different is that you have that you have the combination of these weapons that break and you have the combination of these runes that recharge and like there's not much in between is what you're suggesting yeah i think that that's how they're just gonna break it out and um so they they did say that there were going to be over a hundred of these shrines in the game um and the shrines themselves are the self-contained puzzle areas which can range from you know, three minutes uh, to like 10 to 15 from what we saw of yeah. the demos on the Treehouse stage. So you could have like maybe one puzzle room that you go through and it's the most basic stuff where here's this metal slab, you use the magnesis to lift it and you make a, make a, make a bridge and then you go over it and you're done. Like that is the first thing they showed, the most basic bare bones. And if they were all like that, I would maybe be a little worried, but it does seem that there's going to be this ramp up in the sense once you get off the Great Plateau, you find like more deeper more complex ones and they start taking a longer time and we saw one where you get to this puzzle that 
you clearly have to get this ball to open this door. So what do you have to do? Okay, we need to make that ball free. So we take our arrows and we light them with the fire. And then we use that to burn vines, which lets the ball go. But then the ball has to cross this thing that falls down. So we have to use the stasis to make that stable. And then also use timing to get the momentum with the physics engine to get the ball over. And already we're starting to see the more complex puzzles coming into it, which started to allay my fears that these would be more simple things. It's... Your description is something that perhaps works better in a video than a yes, podcast. Yes, absolutely. But yes. it looks it looks awesome, and I'd highly recommend anyone to just check it out because it's just a great example. I think that's of part physics. four of the shrine stuff oh, uh, in yeah. the Treehouse Dreams. It's, it's the last ones they showed. It was really um, impressive. Yeah, so that's that's definitely stuff to look forward to. But I would be worried if we had just those and no dungeons um, because I really do want... One of the things I like about dungeons is that they always have their own unique aesthetic and environmental things about them and they always, you know, have their own theme. And Mm. the unfortunate thing so far from the shrines is they all look kind of the same. Like, they all have this blue aesthetic and, you know, the futuristic technology underground kind of astrological thing going on. Um, And I do hope that the dungeons we eventually get to will be not only longer and deeper and more complex, but have their own kind of look to make them stand out. I I definitely think that that was just a coincidence in the sense that there we know that there are around over 100 shrines i think that they will be thematic in groups and i think in my opinion the ones we've seen so far are all the same group and i think that l- later groups will be a different theme um hopefully and perhaps each group ties into a matching larger dungeon are you happy with that, though, that we have these 100 shrines uh, to kind of expand the scope of the puzzle-solving stuff? Because I think that was one of the problems they needed to address, is if you have this enormous place to explore, how do you go about, like, getting to places and not getting bored with the systems at play uh, which don't involve, you know, the puzzle-solving we've come to know and love from Zelda? Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of it. I... I really like the shorter, quicker, snappier dungeons of Link Between Worlds. Um, But I think that shorter dungeon style combined with the open world. And obviously we're going to get those big dungeons dungeons as well. I would guess, you know, four or five, um, perhaps around that number of the bigger dungeons. Uh, But I think general gameplay of going in and out of the open world to these small puzzle uh smaller dungeons i think is gonna be great and works really well for what they go what they're going for it does give you a sense of direction i think and i think that's maybe something that uh open world games struggle with uh, in some senses uh Hmm. if it's not like just the main story path i'm sure this game has side quests that you'll find from npcs and villages and everything um but having that constant uh notion of and this is one of the things i really like about the infamous games is you're always on the lookout for these shards which will increase your life and you you always like if you're on one critical path Uh, and you see something off in the distance, you're like, okay, I've got to go over there and get that. It's the same thing with these shrines, I feel. It's like, as soon as you see one, you're like, okay, I need to go down there. Even if I can't do it right now, it'll get marked on my map, and I'll have a fast travel point to come back to it later. And I think, like, they've done a great job with the map as well. You look at it, and you have multiple markers that you can place down. And this is one of those things I really want in Metroid-style games. And Axiom Verge does a little bit of it, but it doesn't kind of go the whole hog, where you have, like, the individual um, icons of weaponry, like swords and bows and bombs and everything. And you can place individual markers on the map to indicate, like, come back here when I have this item and stuff like that. So everything in terms of the UI design, I think, is very smart there. Yeah, it's it's just super everything about this game that I, I I can't I sound like a fangirl right now, but I'm just loving. You are a fan I girl. Am, I am a fan girl, and <laughs> I was a little bit nervous before like all of this was revealed. I was like, everyone is you know hyping this up massively. It really has to hit the mark, and it kind of has exceeded that mark. Dare I say? Yeah, lot lots of cool stuff. Um. Let's talk maybe a little bit about those items because I think it's really cool what we saw from what the treehouse were demonstrating in the shrines. 
is this approach to puzzle design seems to be more open-ended um, because you have the physics engine here that makes objects behave in particular ways we've likened it to trine earlier in the show mm. and i think that these shrines kind of emphasize that much more where they were talking about certain puzzles uh, and there's one where you can open this door by dragging this boulder back to like knock through it mm. and one of the treehouse members said okay, like, I'm going to use the magnesis to draw this back and then let it go and it will move forward and knock out the door. One of the other ones was like... I just ran through. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, so the other person said that they use the stasis to lock the ball in place. And then what you can do is, like, really smack it super hard, which will basically store some momentum inside of the object. And then as soon as the stasis wears off, that momentum all explodes at once. And so the ball just, like, smashed into the door and knocked it open. So using two different item sets, you're able to come to the same solution and, and bypass the puzzle. And I think that is something that seems to be across the entire game when we're talking about this whole temperature system how link goes into a colder area and needs to basically put something on to stay warm um in order to you know stop taking damage so one of those options is to obviously have an outfit that makes you warm you can also eat some spicy food if you've crafted or cooked some of that that'll keep you warm you can have a torch that you carry with you which will give like this bubble of warmth around you you can sit by a campfire to make like this is like four separate ways to achieve the same end Mm. and this game seems to just be doing that in droves and it's just giving you many options and it's like pick a play style do what you like and run with it and i think that that is one of my favorite things about this game is just you have your own play style someone else might do it completely differently but we are giving you options on options to delve into her and it's it's encouraging you to delve into those options because for example at least in this demo and perhaps in the main game the way to get you know the clothes that kept you warm was at the top of the snowy mountain so it was forcing you to either you know use the use the um stick that you lit, lit on fire the torch or to eat the spicy food like it was forcing you to think outside the box and just be like okay i'm not just going to put on something warm because i don't have that yet I'm ha- i have to try something different and experiment yeah it's it's definitely a, a level of creative puzzle solving that we haven't seen in zelda before um i love old zelda dungeons but when you think about them generally there's one solution to everything you come yes. across um and this has just opened the doors and said no there are multiple ways uh to achieve this end and you can just like do it how you like and it will be um, really interesting on those much larger dungeons to see if they can retain that real sense of being able to complete puzzles and tasks in different ways yeah i do wonder i'm very interested into whether the dungeon system itself is going to be play those dungeons in any order like the shrines seem to be um or whether like that may be something that's more linear because i do think and anuma has mentioned uh in various interviews that you can reach the end of the game without necessarily seeing the entire story so like how are they going to deal with the beats of the narrative and are there going to be certain choke points that you get to and you have to like hear this out or do you just bypass that and mm. decide and, you know I'm, i don't care about the story and i'm just gonna uh, go and fight uh, the final boss now so um yeah it's just breaking convention after convention and uh, i i am this might be the most excited I have ever been for a game. I know we have been incredibly effusive in our praise, mm. and there are certainly, you know, maybe some worries about the game, but it's very difficult to see a situation where I am not, like, incredibly impressed when I finally get to play this. I, I'm actually, like, the two most excited times I can remember in my gaming history are easily the launch of the DS and the Wii. And I honestly think that i am sort of in that realm of being excited now that might be because the nx is launching at the same time and i know that that's almost definitely going to launch on the same day as this game and we can maybe get into that but i the level of excitement from the amount that we saw was it's just it's fever pitch it's something special yeah that's it's really great uh before we like go into some other stuff 
Do you have any concerns about this Zelda from what you've seen so far? Um, I, there are a couple things that are sticking in my mind as potential criticisms of things that they can uh, maybe fix or change uh, before it comes out. Obviously, the number one is get that fucking chest uh, open. Absolutely. Uh, um, Got to do that. I mean, we're, we're, we've kind of been through our predictions um, vicariously, and we'll get into those later, but I think... Uh, the biggest sort of fan disappointment online, and and you can argue, and Chris Scullion, formerly of O&M, did tweet this. He was suggesting that it was something, it was an expectation that the fans had created. But I think after that, there were a, a numerous rumors suggesting this, and that was obviously um, that there would be a female Link or at least a female avatar, and or play a Zelda, or know? play a Zelda, just you know, girls, but there's none, and. Anuma has said some very sort of controversial uh, statements on this that are incredibly disappointing and it is now confirmed that there will not be a female Link avatar or playable Zelda and it feels a bit draining in many ways. Um, I, I would argue Link perhaps looks even more androgynous, but that's definitely not the same as playing as a female character. So I yeah. think Nintendo have just so, sort of shot themselves in the foot again when it comes to uh, keeping up with the rest of the world, as harsh as that sounds. Yeah, that's. I, I, I guess that it's really... Uh, it it is obviously something that people have built up in their minds because of rumors and because of just you know this this idea just generally right now in the games industry is people pushing forward with diversity and wanting to have more options in games and things like that um but nintendo never really i don't know that obviously we look at hyrule warriors and we see there that like all these female playable characters and the creation of linkel and her being put in the game and them clearly like realizing the fan feedback of people really like this and, and they want to see more of it um i don't i don't know why the decision was made like that it's clearly the answers that anuma is giving are things that he i don't think he really believes in himself but he just has to come up with an answer and it sounds absurd and ridiculous um but yeah i don't know it's, it's disappointing uh, I think my complaints come on a little bit of a more mechanical level and maybe something that I'm potentially worried about for the rest of the game, but we'll see how it pans out, is um, the notion of uh, being rewarded for exploration. And so in a game like Xenoblade X, you have that idea of getting experience for finding new places and the nodes were always a thing that I wanted to do to you know expand the world and everything. And that game did a great job of rewarding you for going places and finding secrets and things. And so far, it seems a little hit and miss when it comes to uh, those Moblin kind of base camp areas. And this could just be part of the demo, but there is one area where um, someone goes to this massive like skull cave and there's a bunch of Moblins inside. There's a really tough one and you kill them all, fight them, get to the end and you get a treasure chest. And they went op to, to open the treasure chest and inside there was 10 arrows. And I was like, R that's that's not really a great reward for going in and like tackling this relatively tough challenge you know like it feels like there wasn't anything that was giving you a reason to necessarily go there if that's all you're getting to, from to it to play to play devil's advocate here because i am actually in agreement with you but to play devil's advocate i think ultimately aren't the arrows a lot more valuable in this game like it's a lot harder to collect arrows obviously you get your bow relatively early we believe but isn't like on the arrows a real advantage in combat and ultimately maybe those 10 hours are pretty valuable well they are a resource but th we also had a situation on the live stream where one of the treehouse members was like oh yeah sometimes i just sit here and let enemies fire at me and then i just collect endless amounts of arrows like, mm. it doesn't so seem to be a already. massive resource. Yeah. yeah, like, you can just take bunches from enemies anyway. So that seemed to be a little bit of a letdown. Like, there are other uh, opportunities where it seems um, in this game that things with properties to them are just given those properties straight off the bat. So you find just a box of fire arrows. It's not like you have to get an upgrade to get those. They're just instinctively fire arrows mm. and they occupied, mm. uh, occupy a different inventory space. Um but like that, that's the thing. I don't want to get into situations where I'm going after these tough objectives and fighting hard enemies and getting to a treasure chest and being underwhelmed by an item. But on the other hand, 
there was uh, an area later on uh, which I was watching uh, Kind of Funny's video on Zelda and Tim Geddes went into this place which seemed kind of similar to the one I described before but at the end of his one he got the fire rod so you're getting rewarded like it's seemingly more randomly and I guess that is one of those yeah. things where it, it's all about you know sometimes it's going to be a good thing sometimes it's not and we can't necessarily put something amazing in every place so you're just going to have to go to a lot of places in a hope that you get cool stuff um and i i'd like the balance of that to maybe be a bit more skewed towards things that you want but it, it's tough to maybe find that in a world this big i think i could potentially handle random though if it's always going to be not a great item you get that, that's not great that's bad but i think if you if there is that you know maybe a 50 50 chance or a bit better chance that you get something pretty good like a fire rod then i can maybe handle that and it might just encourage you to explore a bit more but i agree with you it's not it's not quite as rewarding as perhaps a game like xenoblade where you you do get that big boost in experience yeah absolutely um and i don't know like they haven't shown any kind of extraneous rpg elements like link doesn't have stats of his own it's just the weapons and armor that he carries um i wonder whether that will maybe play a role but i i doubt mm. it i doubt this is going to be like an experience gaining thing and you get places like obviously the upgrade cycle is going to be much more zelda in nature where you just get different items and weapons which i'm fine with because i love that and i think it's a good loop speaking of concerns we have an email with a concern yes absolutely um, and this is a concern that i've have heard a number of uh, different people on my twitter um, mention so how about we get to that yeah let's get to it so this is from toby friend of the show um who's from the uk hey me zed and bally the new zelda looks beautiful it is atmosphere and exploration in droves the isolation in the game is going to make the characters you do meet feel more important what would you like to see from npcs and will there be any the zelda games have got quieter and quieter in regards to characters and the hyrule community ever since majora's mask this old ruined hyrule suggests it could continue this way thanks toby so yeah, Toby has been uh, uh, relatively vocal on Twitter about... A lot more hit. vocal than that email, I would suggest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, he's, <laughs> he might, he's, might have he's, calmed he's, down he's since. He's tamed himself. Yes, absolutely. Um, but yeah, he definitely wanted to see like big, bright characters and some villages and some NPCs and things like that. And obviously we know because Nintendo have told us that for whatever story reasons, they don't want to show that in this demo. But uh, it does allow us to speculate and kind of think like, what do we want to see? How do we want this world to be expanded and kind of explored upon? Um, and what I want is kind of the antithesis of what Twilight Princess was. Because I think Twilight Princess tried very hard to create characters that were like new and different and engaging. And I think it kind of failed at that task. There's not really much memorable about that cast. And I don't have any like real great connection to them. Uh, as opposed to something with Ocarina of Time where... I think despite that game's age and despite, you know, you not really having that deep a story, there are characters like Saria and Ruto who you see and you see them grow and you see them change over this period of time and you have, like, these memories and, and uh, maybe that's a nostalgia thing on my part because I, you know, played some Ocarina when I was quite young and so, like, it's been carried through since then. But um, I want to see characters that are more fleshed out and i think the voice acting will help with that we've seen that the old man that we've met thus far is the only npc isn't voice acted and as we've said like it's probably going to be a case of fire emblem where it's more of a cutscene thing but i do want that to happen and i do want them to really focus in and create people like Groose, for example, Groose is one of the best characters from Skyward Sword and his development over that game and uh, the way that he uh, is written is fantastic. I mm -hmm. think Skyward Sword actually one of the best written Zelda games, has one of the most engaging yes. narratives that, uh, in, in any of them. And I want to see that continued. I think that they can really uh, do a great job and maybe not have like super, uh, like loads of characters, but focus on a small group and flesh them out and make them important and relevant. I agree. I, I think I think traditionally characters and a sense of atmosphere and that kind of idea 
it's always created through towns, whether that's Ocarina or Wind Waker or whatever. I, I definitely can see where Toby's coming from on that from that aspect. I agree with you, MBZ, that yet yeah, I think having a small group of characters that you, you re can relate to and are dragged through the story um, has created the best 3D Zelda stories. Um, I, I think that the second this game is called Breath of the Wild, it's they just wanted to inject as much wild and like in and that idea into this game as possible and as a result towns can't be wild like you're either in the country and being you know wild and how do i explain this you're either in the wild or you're in a city or a town right. and as much as they there might be some awesome towns in this game it's it doesn't feel like it's going to be the emphasis and and that that might disappoint a lot of fans will there be towns with as much character as something like a windfall island or something like that maybe not but but maybe that's just what this game goes for i might be wrong this, these towns might be far more busy and interesting than i'm giving them credit for but i i think it's they've gone for a while and we have to just sort of sit back and say you know what let's just see what you do with that idea um and i still think you're right there will be a group of characters that are you do get quite close to i have a few theories about what may happen in terms of narrative in this game um i think it's very clear that this world is in a state of kind of post-apocalypse that it has been abandoned that there are clearly not many people alive in this world anymore as a result of, you know, the Calamity Ganon and him taking over the realm and then, you know, the Hyrule Castle being kind of locked away. Um, I have a feeling that there will be, like, smaller settlements where there are very few characters, maybe something like, you know, an, an almost pseudo-rebel alliance where you have a very small group of people who have managed to survive and stay alive and are kind of fighting this cause to retake the kingdom. And I kind of imagine a scenario where, like, as you take dungeons down, you start to maybe reinvigorate and bring people back. And maybe there's something to do with Ganon locking people away. You know, imagine the idea of someone, you know, being um, cast in stone and then, like, unfreezing or something. Like, maybe there are towns and cities that are, like in Twilight Princess, under this control of this uh, entity that has kind of locked it away from the real world. And I feel that maybe the life starts coming back and you know opens up as you progress and as you defeat more dungeons and kind of uh you know pave the way um which i think would be cool i definitely can see that sort of post-apocalyptic thing and it just it's just this one theory that is just stuck in my mind that i've just been thinking about today actually right because um, i linked you the neo gath thread on absolutely it. i i think it's as simple that this is post flood zelda like post flood wind waker i think yeah that, i think that what if you know the 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 water subsides and obviously there's no life left and you, it, like it's implied that the population you know in Wind Waker is very very small in comparison to Ocarina, yeah, uh, because everyone got wiped out and then the few that stayed evolved and changed etc. I think that this is post flood Wind Waker and maybe this link was under in that temple sealed away throughout the whole flood or something and then suddenly it's deflooded and then he's the hero of time for that period of time mm. uh, for the post flood wind waker era who knows i don't know that's just a theory. and obviously the koroks that we've seen um back this theory up but i i think that there is an incredibly interesting story to be told that they've obviously been incredibly tight-lipped about and that's understandable but i think that just because we've seen heavy amounts of game mechanics and not too much in terms of towns i still think this zelda could possibly have more character than any other zelda before because that's it just feels like they're getting everything right and character is such a big part of zelda it's like it's it's arguably what makes it such a distinguishable third person game from so many others like it's got a real sense of itself do you think that the voice we hear at the start is Princess Zelda's voice. Yes. I mean, so... maybe that's too obvious and it's someone else. It's like a Midna-esque character. I, I wouldn't be adverse to that idea, but in, yeah, general, maybe. in general, yes. But you know what? Like when they brought in the Wolf Link amiibo, uh, which I don't know if we talked about this on this podcast yet, but um, 
that is a really actually a neat use of amiibo where it is, the, it is. the wolf comes in and is like your companion he's almost like d-dog in metal gear solid 5 where he just like <laughs> fights alongside you and hunts people yeah. um but when they put him in the game on the treehouse stream they said like oh so you don't really have a companion in this game links like on his own so you know you you can have the, a companion if you want by putting this amiibo Interesting. so so that could be a subtle hint that you know it's not going to be a companion character and that maybe Maybe Zelda becomes your companion in this game. I would really love to see a return to the Tetra-like approach where she has like so much agency and she's actually like competent and does stuff and don't do the thing in the middle of the game where she just puts on a dress and sits underwater yeah. for 200 years. Like do make her like important and a part of the journey and uh, you know really flesh it out. Uh, and that's what I would love to see. I, I want to see a Zelda that is Te important and uh, integral. Yes. I, I, I think that... Um... What was the point I was going to make? I, I think, yes, I think, yes, there might not be a companion character, but I, I think there might be a character that, you know, keeps popping up in, in um, cutscenes. Like, think of something like Alvis from um, Xenoblade. Right, so okay. he's not he's not your companion, but he's always there at every cutscene. And, like, someone who's stalking He's like this you. omniscient force. Exactly. A, I can imagine some sort of stalker character that does communicate with Link a lot. Do you, do you think that might be this old man that we've met already? Maybe not the old man. And I saw a theory that the old man looks a bit like the King of Red Lions from Wind Waker. I thought that There was are theories going around that maybe he's Ganondorf and he's just making you do all these shrines to help his plan. He's got the distinctive Gerudo darker skin. But yes, also he does. The, the, the King of Red Lions maybe through art design or who knows also has that darker skin than yeah. this. I, who knows it's very interesting um so it, it I, is crazy that we've seen this much of this game and already this fan speculation is just because they, i feel they've dangled the carrot that's the thing nintendo yeah. don't know what they've done they've not just said they've not just said right let's just put all of the hints at anything story related away in a chest for no one to see in any of these demos they've said no here's a korok what are you going to think about that huh yeah huh? what are you going to do what are you going to do exactly. about it have some of that and everyone's like oh my god it's a korok it must be linked to wind waker that race and, and, and like it just they know what they're doing and it, it it's smart it creates online hype it creates forum hype um it, it, it's it gives zelda fans something to feed off and it, it, it's exciting on the topic of the Korok, I really hope that, you know, those seeds you get from them lead to something cool because that's something that helps add to the idea of exploration is like, if there are a hundred of these guys over the world and finding them is valuable and you get something cool out of it, like that gives you another incentive to just, you know, explore every nook and cranny possible and go everywhere. Um, it was funny because I was watching an IGN video where they uh, climbed the, to the top of the Temple of Time and when you get to, like, the spire, Link, like, hangs off the side, and you find a hidden Korok at the top of that. So... Crazy. Thing, yeah, crazy. Thing, things like that. Like, because you're able to just climb on literally anything, they can hide secrets everywhere. And you can just, like, go crazy. You can just scour this entire world. Also, um, like, how cool is it that that Temple of Time is a spitting image of Ocarina? Like... Yeah. I just... I absolutely love that. Like, it's just such a... So a, this whole thread cool on thing. Gaff that we're referring to basically posits this theory that this Zelda is like merging of timelines because you go inside and you find uh, the uh, the goddess Hylia, which is literally a spitting image of the Skyward Sword thing. And we have that whole idea. People are having a theory that this great plateau is the thing at the part at the end of Skyward Sword when it descends upon Hyrule, when Skyloft falls to the ground. Like hmm. that this great plateau is Skyloft on top of Hyrule. Like, there are fucking so after, many things after that you the can... flood waters yeah. go from Wind Waker. <laughs> exactly, God. He, like, it's it's all just piecing together. Like, there are pieces of Twilight Princess and Ocarina and Wind Waker. Like, every 3D Zelda is yeah. being weaved into the architecture and and the feel of the world. Um, and it's just it's exciting. This mm. is so like I love this period because it, it, we now know. A decent amount and so the speculation begins and people start just going crazy with it and there's just there's this fever pitch we 
Zelda absolutely destroyed social media. There was a report that the amount of people talking about Zelda was twice the amount than the next highest on social media. And the next highest was Battlefield 1, which, you know, that thing has, like, the most viewed trailer on the internet in, like, however many years and the most likes on YouTube. And yet Zelda is fucking eclipsing it in terms of social media presence. Like, people are invigorated and excited about this game in a way that I haven't seen for something from Nintendo in a really long time. And that bodes well for the game itself, but it also bodes very well for the future of Nintendo and for NX and what they're doing uh, for the rest of this year and for next year. I'll tell you what, I am so much more excited about the state of Nintendo and what is going to happen with NX now, having seen this, than I have yes. been in a long time. Like It just puts in your mind, no matter what NX is, what no matter what other games in the launch lineup are, we have this incredible entity of a game to look forward to. It's very similar to Twilight Princess, but this goes beyond that Twilight Princess game, in my opinion, and the launch of Wii. This feels like more, and, and that's obviously because a lot of aspects of the Wii U were a little disappointing, um, especially how long it's taken for Zelda to come out. But... It just feels like it is coming together and we've always said that when Nintendo have their backs to the wall is the best Nintendo and it feels like this is the this is the 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 good that is coming from that situation. When when they're back to the wall they come up with the best stuff and this feels like some of the best stuff. This is also a young team at Nintendo and we have seen like the incredible yes, yeah, Splatoon, the the um fruits of their labor on that game and this team apparently like they came in and Anuma were like so this like a bunch of these new guys didn't know the traditions of Zelda and the conventions of it and they were like well why can't we change this and he was like well okay why can't we change this let's just change it uh which is really very exciting and like the fact that this is the talk of the town and Splatoon was just so fresh and innovative and interesting we have had legends at Nintendo, but I think new legends are being forged at this very point in time and that we will have people who can become Miyamoto's and Iwata's and Anuma's in the future. Uh, and they are just creating incredible stuff right now, which is just, that's great for the health of the company. It's great for their future. We made a few outlandish predictions on Zelda before. We did, Bally. Shall we very quickly run over... Who's right and who's wrong? Yes, who let's get, do that because I think I'm pretty chuffed, to be honest. I've got a solid... Okay, so my three very quickly were... I said the main selling point is size. Uh, now, that's a bit of a, a cop-out. But I did emphasize I thought there'd be lots of smaller dungeons with bigger, with a few bigger dungeons. I think You I, did, I, indeed. And I mentioned it's a combination of Link Between Worlds with Wind Waker. Now, what I meant by that... Now, obviously, I can. this sounds like I'm retrospectively <laughs> like editing... Uh -huh. What I mean by that is that you're getting these short, sharp dungeons combined with the open space of Wind Waker. And I'm, I'm pretty confident that, that this demonstration showed that. So I'm going to claim a point for this one. Okay. Secondly, voice acting I thought would be in the game and Link would be silent. That's not 100% confirmed, but I think you predicted it as well. So maybe we can just both take a point on that, right? Sure, let's... let's t I'll, I'll look... We don't yet know whether Kevin Spacey is Tingle, but oh, I will I'll hold even, off. Don't even. <laughs> so I'm two for two. And then the third one, I went with Female Link. And I thought that Female Link would be a big part of that opening trailer. Like Even during the trailer, I thought, yes, the big reveal is going to be Female Link. And I don't, I'm trying to remember what the big reveal of the trailer was. It, what, it was the reveal, sorry, the reveal was almost like a montage of things Link does. If yes. That makes sense. Like it, it, it there was no one thing almost. So I was wrong on that one. I'm going to take two out of three. MBZ, come at me. So um, I said that the final name will be revealed as The Legend of Zelda with no subtitle. You were close because it, there was a delay in the subtitle coming and you were like, I've got it, I've got it, I've got yeah. it. And then it yeah, just I, I thought I had won. I thought I was correct in it was just being The Legend of Zelda. And then it was just like, Breath of the Wind or The Wild. God damn it. The, wind, the wind. <laughs> wind keeps coming up, actually. I think that Jeff yeah. Gersman made the same uh, slip of the Breath tongue of the uh, yeah. saying it. But yeah, that actually funny because Wind Waker, Breath of the... It, it seems I, like it would fit nicely. I went for Enchanted Plane as well and, yes. I, and I, I backtracked and went for something Sheikah related and I was wrong on both of those but uh, yeah anyway what was your number two 
So my other one was uh, the voice acting, which we've uh, covered already. Um, but I think I'm going to take a big point for this one. This, is, a, a, this is an impressive point. I'll, yeah, I'll give I, you this I said one. in a callback to the original Legend of Zelda, you'll be able to burn down bushes that lead to hidden secrets and yep. areas and stuff. Yep. And not only was that like a key mechanic yep. of the game, but in the... There's, there was a part of the Treehouse stream that was literally called the NES Connection, yes. in which Miyamoto came on yes. and talked about all the ways this game was the mm. same as the NES game. Not only that, but Bill Trinan like called out the bush burning thing as part of that live stream. Yeah. So I think like on every front, I fucking nailed that prediction. So there you have it. Tie, 2-2. Two, two. Two, 2 2, yeah. 2 for 2 this time. Uh, we had some other predictions. Maybe we'll come to those next time when we talk we'll about the other things later, at E3. Absolutely. Um, because we just wanted to make this all about Zelda. It, 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 it is kind of astounding. The amount we have talked about this game is like twice the amount we talked about all of their stuff last year. And I think that is just not only testament to the enormity and the amount of information we have, but to our excitement level and our engagement in this new game. I tell you what, I, I pray that they have this game at Gamescom when we go. In, um, go yes, in, please. In please, like, Nintendo. We Also, there's probably going to be loads of people wanting to play it, so we're going to probably have to stand in line for a stupid amount of time. But you um, know what? We know that even when we stand in line that stupid amount of time, we're going to get a hefty half-hour-long session. Yeah, absolutely. Like 40 minutes probably because the two demos were like 15 and 20 each. Um, Great. So, yeah, it's it's a significant chunk of the game. It, and uh, having seen a lot of the footage, I feel like I want to pick a direction that I've just not seen anyone go in. And, and the amazing thing is like... Run it. Yeah, we can do that now. Like we can legitimately go and try and find something um that that hasn't been revealed mm. because there's there's so much in even that tiny portion of the game like i still like um i go back to that map and just like holy shit like i remember looking at the map at the game awards and thinking that's pretty big but it, it wasn't like wowing me in the same way that xenoblade was and this is absolutely wowing me in the same way xenoblade was um so man it's, pitch. it's going to be a big summer. I mean, we've just we've got Zelda to look forward to, which we think is going to come around March, supposedly. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're going to Gamescom. We're hopefully going to play Zelda. And yes. Before you know do. it, we're going to be into September, October. And that's when we're thinking there's going to be some sort of NX reveal. So it's only uphill from here. It is. Yeah. Like this is, I think this is the start. This is the, uh, the one fork in the road that we get to. And we're like, okay, it... This is the start of the climb for Nintendo again. We're getting back up to those heights. It's just the um, perfect game to start that climb. Like it's something that sells pretty well. Zelda sells pretty well. Not com- it's not it's not you know Pokemon numbers, but it's pretty good compared to the other you know games in the Nintendo library. It's a game that's going to hopefully just engage the industry. They're all going to play it. They're all going to talk about it. It's just going to get online journalists pumped and that is so valuable for nintendo it, like there is so much buzz around this game and people are talking about it in a way that i have not seen people who don't follow nintendo engage with a zelda game in an mm. incredibly long time that whole uh, nes connection is a smart move because the number of gamers you hear um who just say oh, i used to like nintendo you know i was a, i was an nes guy i was a super nintendo guy that's when nintendo made proper games i don't i don't play their crappy wii and wii u that they come up with these days like i'm waiting for you know the the rebirth of a, a traditional like nintendo game a real back hearkening to the the old days kind of nintendo game and this game is basically just giving a middle finger to the whole world and saying we can do something different and new that is still refers to the classic nes games and refers to the zelda lineage and just blow it out of the park and that's just so what nintendo needs and it's it's incredibly incredibly um exciting to look forward to i'm uh i'm jazzed bali like we knew that this was going to be the only game here and you know what (laughs) i think it was the right call i think it was the right call like (laughs) It was isn't, right. it, isn't it amazing how every time we question Nintendo and their decision making, somehow they come back and are like, well, we were kind of right. Like, not all the time, 
But a lot of the time, they, they come back and they're like, they're like yeah, we, we needed six hours of Treehouse streaming to fully explain this game. And I thoroughly believe that because the number of systems and options and stuff you can do in this game is deserving of that time. And I sat there and was glued for the entire stream. And that has not happened with anything they have shown at Treehouse before. Um, so props to them. Props to this game. I'm unbelievably excited. And... Um, Man, Bally, it's going to be a tough wait. I will tell you what, because I want this now. I just want to play this and not stop. We're talking three quarters of a year. Yeah, probably. As long year. as uh, nothing else gets delayed, which, oh dear, that's a real possibility, which I don't want to think about, but it's a possibility. Um, before we stop talking about Zelda, is there any like, little moment or little thing that you want to pick out as, as a cool... Uh, thing you liked from zelda hmm have you got one can you come back to i me? do yeah because th th this was something i didn't mention but i just was like okay this is like the perfect thing that just like illustrates all these systems working amazingly together so there's no fishing rod that we've seen thus far but there are fish in the water um, uh, I know, and I know you can you can use them uh in like cooking recipes so how do you get the fish well these bombs because they're magical and they don't have any kind of light to them, you can just drop them in the water and the bombs are effective on enemies that like swim, uh, which includes just the innocent fish there. So the treehouse member threw in a bomb and labeled it bomb fishing and just murdered fish with bombs in the water and then just took them and then started using them in recipes. I just thought, wow, that's like, it, the bomb is not supposed to be used for this, but mm. you can do it anyway. And that I think just encapsulates what this Zelda is. I think I think the moment for me was just sitting there watching a stream of Link inside a single room with like a few puzzles and thinking like we're finally getting like puzzle room like individual puzzle room Zelda and just looking at it and thinking this looks unbelievable and with the the, the lighting and everything it just looks so good and it it i just had to sort of pinch myself and think we're actually in an era where zelda is reinventing itself and trying new things and I, i'm most excited about the idea of having like i said open world with these shorter dungeon experiences that is just perfect it's absolutely perfect well valley uh we have talked your ears off and uh i think that it is probably time for us to wrap up this e3 show uh, we'll be back on our normal schedule uh, with our next show and um, there are other things Nintendo have talked about um, I don't think any of them are relevant enough uh, for us to concentrate seeing as Zelda was the talk of the show um, but we will cover them we'll get back to that stuff and uh, we'd like to hear your thoughts about Nintendo's presence at E3 so uh, continue to send in emails to the show and you can do that at our email address which Bally will now tell you this Nintendo life at gmail.com that's this Nintendo life at gmail.com and we want to hear from you so uh, keep sending them uh, you can find us on the internet and you can get our thoughts on all things Zelda and Nintendo Bally where can people find you you can find me on the Twitters I'm at Ballyman91 that's B-A-L-L-Y-M-A-N-9-1 that's also my name on the Miiverse I've been playing all sorts of things here and there, here and there. I've been pretty busy, but trying to trying to truck on with a bit of Fire Emblem Fates, so hopefully posting a bit about that. But I've been bogged down by E3 coverage. Yes, absolutely. Uh, me too. But um, we'll we'll get back to all that stuff uh, very soon. You can find me on Twitter at LordNBZ. That is my Meverse name as well. And you can find us on Twitter as a podcast because our podcast has an account. And that is at TNL Podcast. Follow us there for... Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if we've actually posted our, our live reactions, but we recorded, we streamed live on Twitch our first reaction to the first hour of Zelda. Uh, so we'll pop that up on we'll our Twitter account. We'll get those tweeted. We'll get those and, tweeted. And uh, put those out so you can find those links there. 
um, which is uh, hopefully uh, interesting to you people. Uh, you can find us on many places. You can download us on iTunes. We're on Stitcher. We are on YouTube. And uh, you can hear us uh, whenever we post episodes, which is every two weeks. Um, and uh, obviously E3 throws our schedule off a little bit. But we will be back to regular uh, next time. So do not worry about it. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. We Maybe we'll give a call out this time for it's E3 time. People are looking for podcasts to listen to things about Nintendo. This is a great time to review us on iTunes. Uh, so if you have not done so already, reviewing us on iTunes is probably the best thing you can do to help the show. Uh, it allows us to open up to new listeners, get the podcast more feedback generally, and, and you know uh, perpetrate it through the listings on iTunes um, so that more people uh, listen to the show, uh, which is what we want, more engagement, all that stuff. So if you haven't before, review us on iTunes. That would be wonderful. Um, so we look forward to that. And, and if you're someone who just loves downloading a ton of E3 podcasts to listen to everyone's reactions, and this is your first time listening to this Nintendo Life, I just want to say I hope you enjoyed the show, and I would love it if you would subscribe. Yes, do that. It's very easy on iTunes. I'm sure it's easy on other services as well, but <laughs> iTunes is the one where most people go to listen to podcasts. Um, so yes, if you're a first-time listener, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this chat, and... Uh, We'll be back with more of this stuff. We talk about Nintendo every two weeks. It's a good show. It's a good fun time. Um, and uh, I guess that's going to close it. Bali, any last words? See you soon. I mean, it's going to be less than two weeks because this is an extra show. Yes, it is indeed. Um, so, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll see you next time. And uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we'll continue to keep talking about Nintendo until the company goddamn goes away. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll see you. Thanks for listening. Goodbye, everyone.